Hello, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to this uh, panel on commercial space. Um, really appreciate you all coming. And uh, just before we start, I just have a few announcements. Um, we would like to thank today's breakout session room sponsor, Sayari. Also, questions uh, will be submitted via question cards, so please start writing your questions as soon as you can think of a question. Don't wait until the end um, of the session, and then pass them to the member of the staff that will be collecting them around the room. Um, also, this session is not eligible for continuing education credits, and media will be present, may be present during the breakout session. Um, so, with that, um, let me just set the stage um, for this panel discussion on the role of the commercial space-based intelligence industry in national security. Uh, this is a topic that we have been hearing a lot about since the Russian invasion of Ukraine. And uh, a, a lot of us in the media have called this, uh, the war, this war the first commercial space war. And you've all seen the images on the news every day. Um, this has been the story of commercial space telling the story about the war. Um, from the very beginning, from the buildup of Russian forces on Ukraine's borders and uh, all the combat and humanitarian relief operations that followed. Um, so, and this is really the first time that we have seen, um, that we have had access to information that previously was only available uh, from government sources and not often seen by the public. Um, this is an industry that is growing very fast. We have two of the companies here represented on the panel, and there are many others, and they're launching hundreds of satellites. So this will be a very um, dynamic sector of the space industry. So to dig deeper into this discussion, I will introduce our panel. Um, here to my right, we have Dave Gauthier. He is the director of the Commercial and Business Operations Group at the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency. NGA um, is the agency responsible to analyze and distribute geospatial intelligence to the national security community. Uh, Dave also serves as the first ever chairman of the Intelligence Community Commercial Space Council that provides uh, strategic and policy recommendations to the IC senior le leadership. Um, next to Dave, we have Tony Frazier. He's executive vice president and general manager of the public sector earth intelligence of Maxar Technologies. Um, Maxar is the primary supplier of satellite imagery to the US government and operates the Maxar News Bureau that, uh, since the start of the war, has supplied imagery to the news media free of charge. Um, Maxar operates four high-resolution imaging satellites and plans to launch six more in the coming months. Uh, next to Tony, we have John Huth. He is the chief of the Defense Intelli Intelligence Agency's Office of Space and Counterspace. Um, this office is focused on space domain awareness, a, um, which is a, a growing area of interest due to the importance of the space domain and national security. And um, John is also the vice chair of the IC Commercial Space Council that um, Dave chairs. Um, next to um, John, we have James Doggett. Vice President of Mission Assurance of Hawkeye 360. Um, Hawkeye 360 is a commercial provider of space-based radio frequency data and analytics. The company operates 15 satellites that monitor electronic emissions, has flown over 1,000 missions over Ukraine, and the company's services have been in high demand, um, especially to track the location of GPS jammers that the Russian military deployed in the Donbass region. And um, last but not least, we have Frank um, Garcia. He is a professional staff member from the House Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence. Uh, this committee oversees the U.S. intelligence community on a broad range of issues, 
specifically on this top, the topic for this panel, uh, Frank's committee has been paying close attention to the developments in the private sector with regard to uh, geospatial intelligence and how the IC leverages commercial technology. So to get started, um, I'd, like to, um, I'd like to have asked Dave to kick us off telling us about how NGA and the intelligence community mobilized leading up to the Russian invasion of Ukraine to double purchases of commercial imagery. And Dave, if you can please give us a sneak um, behind the scenes look at what, what had to be done to mobilize all these companies to bring all the commercial providers together, work with other agencies and con allied countries. Tell us what happened. <laughs> Great, thank you, Sandra, and, and I'm thrilled to be here. Thank you to INSA, and AFSIA, and the great panel members uh, you see here with me. Uh, I think we're all witnessing how commercial capabilities are changing our perspectives of the world around us and increasing our ability to deliver decision advantage. Uh, the war in Ukraine perfectly captures the innovative use of commercial technologies for profound mission effect. And first, we used satellite imagery you know, to reveal the truth to the public, which you mentioned. And then more specific to that, we started using analytic insights uh, from commercial companies to gain information advantage and, and help our allies and partners. And NGA really did three things. I'll highlight three out of many that we did. One you've already mentioned, we, with the NRO, we immediately doubled the amount of commercial imagery being purchased over Ukraine. Uh, then with the NRO again, Number two, we rapidly integrated a new type of imagery, which is commercial SAR, about a year earlier than expected into our um, operations. And we delivered that commercial SAR directly to forward users. Um, and then the third thing, we increased purchases of commercial analytic services, both for you know, Ukrainian activities, but also around the world. And so those commercial services gave us insights into the pattern of life at airfields and other places around the world. But you asked me, how did we do this? How did we lead up to this? So I think it took significant preparation and um, over time, the changing of business processes so that we could be poised for rapid action. And um, I'll offer three things that we've been doing over the past couple of years that enabled our preparation. One. Uh, we do continuous market research and industry engagement. And we know the art of the possible from our commercial vendors and partners. And so that continuous interaction enabled us to be ready uh, when commercial capabilities were available to the market. Uh, the second thing is we award flexible contracts for new services and in a tr almost a, um, an evaluation period, but they're, those contracts are designed to scale up into operational uh, purchases uh, right from the beginning. So we didn't have to do anything different to scale up. And then third, we already had a World Wide Web delivery system in place to get imagery to disadvantaged users around the world. And uh, that's called Global Enhanced Geo and Delivery. And thanks to partners like Maxar here, uh, we've been operating that capability with them and um, it was instantly available to the forces in Ukraine. So having that, those capabilities ready for action uh, was, was fantastic. So probably the most dramatic of those was the ability to get commercial SAR um, on contract, integrated into operations, delivered to forward users in Ukraine um, almost overnight. And we did that by having um, several companies already on contract doing testing and integration. And then when it was necessary to enable that data to the forward user, we sort of lifted all the regular um, processes that the government would use to um, shake that out and integrate that in operations and enable the data to flow and then rapidly enabled it to flow to forward users. And then in a third step, we told the companies that we would appreciate uh, their, their ability to flow that data directly and, and enable access to their vendor portals. And so it was a new uh, role for NGA to say, why don't, why don't we enable uh, direct company action uh, to do this? And, and the companies, uh, 
I can't say enough about our world-class technology industry in this country. They're able to innovate on the fly. Uh, they're motivated to make a difference. Several companies, including the two on this panel, signed something called the Space Industries for Ukraine, and other analytics companies worked with us at no cost to deliver their insights to those in the field. So I think, I think uh, our tech industry in this country is also a hidden enabler for all this activity. Yeah. Thank you very much, uh, Dave. I think following up to that, I'd like to get Tony and, and uh, James uh, from the industry side to talk about you know, what does this all mean for the future? Uh, you know, the commercial now played a big role, but is this a, is this a real turning point? Is, is the government sending you the right demand signals, so to speak? Um, what investments do you think you need to make for the future, and what would you like the government to do to be able to continue to support the government um, and, and, and not just be a one-time build-up and, and then go back to business as usual? Uh, Tony? Uh, sure, I'll start. Um, so, so thanks again for the opportunity, uh, Sandra, and, and really uh, humbled by the, <laughs> my colleagues on the panel. I guess the way that I would um, summarize that uh, an answer for you, Sandra, is that just like you know, COVID changed how we work, you know, I think we, you know, we all learned new ways that we could be productive you know, through telework. I think that you know, the Ukraine crisis and now conflict became an accelerant you know, for you know, how we would leverage commercial space uh, to support missions that uh, people traditionally thought you know, were limited to national systems. And so that, that involved both uh, changing how we collect you know, data and make it available you know, to address you know, the, the types of uh, disinformation campaigns you know, that, that Russia you know, was uh, espousing. But then also it, it created an opportunity as we built more awareness you know, of the capability, the quality of the data that we could collect that was made available through media, I think it created a virtual cycle you know, where because of the things that you know, Dave referenced in terms of understanding what capabilities were available, you know, having uh, contract vehicles that could go from uh, demonstration and prototype you know, into production, uh, and also you know, being able to have the systems to deliver the data to the end users, you know, I think that created uh, a, you know, we, we saw just a tremendous increase you know, in adoption you know, of, our, uh, of our content and of other um, you know, providers you know, content. And so I think that was all really good. And you know, that's been consistent with the mission that we supported uh, for, for many years you know, at, at Maxar. I think what was also really exciting was that it took things that we were exercising a year ago uh, with uh, different mission partners, you know, the, the Army, you know, as an example, with their Project Convergence 22 and, you know, other efforts like Scarlet Dragon, and some of the advanced capabilities like artificial intelligence, machine learning, you know, also leveraging, you know, things like, um, you know, uh, 3D terrain, you know, commercial 3D terrain data, we were seeing that applied as well, you know, to the mission. And so I, I think uh, this is an enduring um, capability, you know, that can be, uh, valuable for a variety of missions, you know, whether it's you know, understanding order of battle, you know, indicators and warning, uh, you know, broad area search, uh, and so, uh, so we're excited about you know, the opportunity to continue to extend the partnership. Great, thank you, Tony. James? Thank you. We got no green light, can you all hear me? Mm -hmm. All right, good. Um, yeah, great point so far, good discussion. So I think, uh, like a lot of us in industry, we were able to see uh, a quick response to the initial crisis through reprogramming effort really across the board in the company, not just the operations or the analysis shop using existing capability, but even across our engineering development organization, we were able to really surge on some efforts to, um, to get new capability out into the hands of users, as Dave already mentioned. Um, and that's the value that I think commercial industry brings to the intelligence national security community is um, two things, a flexible software-defined architecture, not just bits of software-defined kit, but actually the whole approach to how we do development, and then the agile workforce that goes along with that for every sense of the word agile. Um, and so from my perspective, where do we go from here and answer the question? I think one of the most important things is we on the industry side need to make sure that the outputs of this rapid burst of innovation that we all just went through together in partnership with users 
don't get lost. Um, if we just uh, all got together earlier this year and did a Ukraine-themed hackathon and then put the results of that on the shelf and leave it there, uh, that is the valley of death, and that is um, leaving innovation on the table. So I think uh, following on what uh, Dave and, and uh, Tony have already said, it's important for us to capture the outcomes, capture the lessons learned, and roll that back into the baseline of our products and services that we on the industry side bring to USG and uh, partner customers. Um, not just the products and services, but also the SLAs and the contracts that form the ICD between industry and user community. So I think that's an important thing for us to capture going forward. Thank you, um, James. Um, I'd like to ask um, John from the Defense Intelligence Agency. Um, you are a customer of NGA. You, you are a user of data. And you are working in, a, in, a, in an office that deals with the threats that posed in the space domain. So how does the commercial industry help you in that? In, in achieving that, in getting better information, and what maybe opportunities do you see now that there is more commercial capability? What opportunities do you see for companies trying to support EIA? Sure, thank you. Can, can you all hear me? Yeah, hear me there if I can hear myself <laughs> now, great. Um, so first of all, DIA's role is to provide military intelligence to our Warfighters to our policymakers and to our acquisition customers, um, not just the foundational, but working with the combatant commands and the J2s that we uh, staff to provide that operational intelligence, as well as embassies around the world. So there's broad utility of commercial imagery and other commercial burgeoning co uh, commercial capabilities across the DIA enterprise, which is a worldwide enterprise, uh, to support. Uh, both those customers as well as our collaborators uh, in other countries. Um, beyond the commercial imaging, uh, we've been very interested and have been an early adopter of commercial SDA, space domain awareness capabilities. Uh, and that's beyond the, what you might consider the traditional find, fix, and track role of things, but more on the characterized side, and that's really the intelligence mission. What is the function of that object on orbit? What's normal? What's changed? Um, we're interested in what I call the entire haystack, uh, because uh, things that look dead might not be dead. Uh, things that look like debris may or may not be debris, and you can't tell that unless you're looking persistently over time. And uh, commercial SDA brings that, and it's also complementary just as Commercial imagery is complementary to our, our national uh, imaging capabilities. Commercial SDA is also very complementary to uh, basically our, our homegrown systems, if you will. Um, and that's ground or space-based, although I'll say, you know, at least here to four, a lot of what we've looked at, and because that's been more available, has been some of the ground-based uh, capabilities, uh, both the, the data first we looked at, as well as now uh, products uh, from companies such as ExoAnalytics and Leo Labs, and certainly we're interested in what our partners up here can provide, and we've been having those discussions going forward as well. Um, and also, speaking of going forward, so we talk about particular parts of the electromagnetic spectrum. Going forward for SDA, we'd be very interested in seeing what leverage, uh, what uh, we can what we can leverage from industry as they think about other parts of the electromagnetic spectrum uh, beyond the optical and normal RF, if you will, um, magnetic nuclear materials capabilities. Uh, one of the DIA's jobs on the collection side is uh, measurements and signatures intelligence. So there's a lot more there that I think commercial industry can bring. Mm -hmm. And certainly, uh, again, uh, we've, a, we've been an early adopter of the SDA. We will continue to be uh, consumers of the imagery and imagery capabilities as they evolve and uh, supporting our worldwide mission. Thank you, John. Um, as, as a segue to my next question, um, there's a quote from Dr. Chris, uh, Dr. Scalise, Christopher Scalise, uh, the director of the NRO, who said, um, the world is changing, we need information faster, and we need to deliver it quicker. So, Frank, um, I mean, this is, this is a goal, right? Um, f uh, faster, uh, more responsive intelligence. Uh, however, we just saw a report from the from the Government Accountability Office um, 
that was directed by the intelligence uh, committees that actually points out the government is really not moving very fast, that they're kind of still wedded to the traditional contracting methods and the industry is moving fast, the government is not catching up. I know we've heard that before. I know people like Dave are doing a lot to try to change that, but what, what, can, what is your take on you know, this GAO report and the, your, the committee's views on you know, whether the government is really doing enough? So uh, before I start, I do have to give an obligatory disclaimer. So views expressed by me during this panel are mine. <laughs> do not necessarily reflect an official position of the House Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence or an official government position, but are intended to provide fodder for thought and help define areas where industry and government may have shared interests. And hopefully that's OK. And I can still answer the question from my own personal view. <laughs> um, the second thing is, it's not a surprise to anybody that you know, things can be contentious on the Hill. And, and I have found um, a really nice little uh, uh, book written by George Washington. And it's called uh, George Washington's Rules of Civility and Decent Behavior. Um, I, I don't get you know any anything for promoting this. I think he you know his royalties are long gone, but there were a few things in here that I thought um, were germane to any panel. But uh, be not tedious in discourse or in reading unless you find company pleased therewith. I'll, I'll try not to read too much. Um, before commenting on the the GAO report. Um, yeah, I would like to make an observation, you know, from my perspective on the committee and with regard to what is commercial and, and I would also add the proliferation of unmanned aerial systems in the battle space. What has, how has that changed kind of warfare? And, and in my mind, and this may shock some people, um, I, I really believe that the proliferation of commercial remote sensing and UAS is erasing the tactical advantage. If not today, within the next three years, with the onset of, you know, as China launches more and more and more satellites, that the, um, you know, it, the song comes to mind, Nowhere to Run, Nowhere to Hide, uh, Martha and the Vandellas, for those of you that have heard that before. <laughs> but to, to be more precise, I believe the edge, the tactical advantage has shifted from sensing to analytic product timelines. And so it's about a whole lot more than just what's on orbit. It's about the combination of, of data in the ground network to bring things that are tactically actionable. And, and I think at least tactical um, skirmishes are gonna be won or lost based on, on how fast we can bring that to market. And what does that mean? That means that in the future, that tactical edge is going to go to those that either can disrupt the other hostile actors' uh, network or, um, or basically eliminate their satellites from, from s in some way. Um, turning to uh, the GAO report, so you know, in the last couple of weeks, there were two reports that, that came out. One was a, uh, um, a GAO report that we asked uh, the Government Accountability Office to take a look at what are the authorities within uh, for, for contracting both data collection and um, data services? Um, the, the, the GAO report is a, I think it has some good observations in it and that it does focus on um, that there's a very different approach to creating analytical product and or buying services. I personally believe that um, you know, we don't necessarily need an acquisition organization doing procurement of commercially available data. I, th I think that's you know, fine on a, a, a GSA schedule, but we do need an acquisition organization working with industry to develop that next generation of capabilities that's gonna benefit both commercial applications and government intelligence collection and combat support. And that's the area that um, the GAO report kind of talked about a little bit. Um, and, and I think that we need to uh, go back and be um, perhaps very deliberate about having an acquisition organization run 
a data procurement, uh, data procurement contracts. I, I don't necessarily think, I think there's an inherent conflict of interest there, but again, my personal view on this. Thank you, Frank. Yeah, Dave, please. Go ahead. Well, I just wanted to bonus on, on Frank's comments about um, speed for tactical advantage, because I think he's spot on when, when he says that, um, even though he's being provocative. <laughs> so, um, and that's why NGA prefers purchasing insights, indicators, knowledge, analytic services directly uh, from commercial providers. And we really feel automated exploitation of the raw data, be that imagery or other data sources, using machine learning or cloud-based processing by the vendors in, in their IT stacks reduces the latency for us. It reduces the barriers to operational use and the integration into our workflows. So when companies create value-added products and services, it helps us deliver better insights at speed. And speed is king. So, um, you know, and I just want to take a moment to mention how much we're focusing on purchasing these services. And in 2022, uh, we've started really increasing the buying, uh, both for Ukraine and around the world. So we're buying automated detections that tell us things about infrastructure, you know, roads, rails, airfields, building damage. We're buying automated detections that tell us about objects, uh, cars, ships, and aircraft. And we're buying automated detections that tell us about activities, you know, whether that's illegal phishing, change detection, um, GPS interference, or even plumes of methane. You know, these are great products and services that industry is fully capable of creating and delivering at speed, and we, we can use them that way. That's a great point. I think a lot of people don't realize that you have, you know, you have the satellite imaging companies like Maxar and Planet that they, they map the, the, the Earth um, and they provide mapping, but then you have these newer companies like, for example, you know, Hawkeye 360, they will detect a, um, emissions from a ship and then maybe, you know, another uh, radar, SAR satellite will verify the location and then you could have, you could tip and cue the uh, imaging satellite like Maxar or Black Sky to go and take a picture. So that is, I think that's what, what you're talking about is getting that integrated multi-intelligence product. I guess the question is for, for Tony and, and James, um, what is sort of the next step for the industry and government to be able to take advantage of these capabilities? Is there a need for different types of contracting, maybe not works in silos so much? Um, and, and kind of what is, you know, what, what are some of, what are your expectations for how the government can do that? Well, I mean, I think we have to look at missions on different horizons. Uh, so one thing that was highlighted in the GAO report was that, you know, 98% of the uh, the charting, mapping, geodesy uh, mission was satisfied with commercial. Uh, and that's an enduring requirement. Uh, and so you can award a 10-year contract you know, where you ensure that you have continuity of source to support that mission. I think for many of the other examples that have been highlighted, you know, those are more uh, perspective. You know, there's, you know, there, the missions may be fleeting, uh, and, and also it may require a mashup of capabilities in order to satisfy you know, a, you know, a, a mission need, and you need different types of uh, acquisition methods, you know, to be able to, uh, to evaluate it, uh, prototype it, and then take it to scale. Uh, and, and I guess my thought on that point is that uh, we should have a, uh, it, that process should be democratized. Uh, and, and I think the things that, you know, Dave referenced that NGA is doing, you were spot on, uh, but we've seen, you know, other mission partners, whether it be uh, Army Futures Command, you know, we, we saw that with, you know, Vricon was a, a joint venture. You know, we had established that was awarded a, an OTA, you know, for the One Will Terrain uh, project. Uh, DIU, I know, has, you know, been, has, has used that as a way to kind of experiment, you know, with capabilities. I think there's a, there's a need to be able to allow uh, engagement with mission partners to then identify what they need uh, and then uh, create the way to both um, expedite the acquisition, 
But one element that I think is really, really important is you have to get directly engaged with end users. You know, we, for many years uh, in my journey, I've been with the company for 12 years, you know, we, uh, we, we, we provided imagery you know, into the architecture, but we didn't have a direct relationship with the end users. Uh, and it's very different going down to Fort Bragg and you know, seeing how they apply you know, the capability and, and then looking at how you can uh, really work these timeline issues. You can figure out where the bottlenecks are you know, and get to uh, delivering insights at the speed of need. Uh, and so I think, I think it's a combination of you know, these uh, democratized acquisition pathways, uh, being you know, really close to the end um, uh, mission partner, uh, and then you know having that drive the innovation cycle. I think that's how you know we can you know accelerate the process. Thank you, um, James. Yeah, um, all good points again. Thank you. And I'm gonna uh, dovetail off of one of them, which is engagement with users. That is absolutely critical. Um, I meant I used the the agile word earlier, which can be a bit of a four letter word, but it's actually critical and and kind of vital to how the commercial industry engages. Um, and so being able to have that close feedback loop is, is very, very important. Um, I think the, um, the other thing that I want to dovetail off of here is missions may be fleeting. So, you know, we, we went through this crisis that surged the amount of imagery and other sources being uh, purchased. And uh, eventually this crisis will abate one way or the other and we'll go back to, as you said earlier, Sandra, business as usual to a certain extent. Um, so how do we mitigate that on the commercial side to continue providing value? I think there's a couple of different ways. Um, one, uh, one observation we had from reading the GAO report is it is very imagery focused, as, as was directed. Um, for those of us in the non-imagery commercial uh, products and services world, we really appreciate the uh, kind of the going first from the imagery side because we're going to encounter those same challenges. Mm -hmm. Uh, let alone when you get into the value-added analytics in terms of multi-int and, and other things along those lines. So I think it's important to keep an eye on what's happening right now today. Um, but back to the, the missions may be fleeting mitigations, I think there's, there's two main areas. One is we do need to do that innovation capture that I mentioned earlier. We do need to roll the results of this effort back in so that the uh, intrinsic value brought by commercial is still recognized across the board even when uh, the world isn't necessarily on fire to the same extent that it is today. Um, that's non-trivial work. It's not easy to uh, take the results of some really quick bursts of creative activity and make that a part of baseline operations, but it is work that has to be done. Um, and then the second piece that I'll say is maybe a little bit um, out of left field, but I do think when the fleeting mission demand signal from USG goes down, as it inevitably will one way or the other, um, for uh, established companies like Maxar, that's a concern for uh, newer and more, uh, newer and smaller companies of our class or even newer, it can be existential. Um, so we get the, the strong signal from USG all the time that the government does not want to be the anchor tenant, the sole anchor tenant for commercial entities. And as a taxpayer, I'm fully on board with that. I think that's the right approach. Um, in the case where then USG isn't going to be the sole anchor tenant and there is a small or non-existent <coughs> domestic commercial market, that means by default, in order to make the revenue needed to stay alive and to return investment from VC and other sources, companies will need to export. And so for this community, I think it's important to note that the IC in particular is a really important partner in navigating the interagency for export authorization. And I think that's a, a key area where government can act as a partner, if not a funder, um, and again, kind of mitigate some of those uh, fleeting missions. So hey, if I could add a little yeah, bit on, on non-Earth imaging. So you talk about fleeting targets. Things can move fast on the ground. They move even faster on orbit. <laughs> so if we're, if we're looking at uh, the cloud, so to speak, that I mentioned, or the haystack, and uh, we see something on the maneuver having an ability to augment with commercial, commercial imagery on non-Earth imaging or non-Earth other collection to help that characterization quickly is something that I think the SDA community can learn from mm -hmm. what we've built up over over 20 years, right? Uh, I think there's uh, there might be some uh, misunderstanding that all of a sudden this commercial imagery popped out of nowhere in the last couple of years, but this is a long time coming. So mm -hmm. I'm hoping for SDA and other types of commercial applications, we can learn a lot of lessons that we've already learned and not have to repeat them. Thank you. I wanted to... Um 
maybe allow all of you to comment on the point that James made. You know, the, the, the NRO gave 10-year contracts to three companies, Maxar, uh, Planet, and Black Sky, um, and then you have a lot of other companies that, you know, like James said, um, the government expects you to be a viable commercial supplier um, and, and not have to depend entirely on the government, but I mean, is that realistic to expect that? Um, so maybe, Dave, uh, do you think maybe there's a better way to work with the industry so that you know, they're not so vulnerable to you know, the commercial market or the export market? And maybe, Frank, if you have some thoughts on that as well. Sure. Uh, if, if I've learned anything from talking to hundreds and hundreds of industry <laughs> members, uh, probably the most important factor is, for them is, besides revenue, of course, but the, other, the second most important factor is predictability from the government. And so when the government is not regulating with predictable outcomes um, or, or you know, causing someone like Hawkeye 360 to deal with export issues unexpectedly. Uh, when the government is not advertising or um, you know, its needs effectively, and when the government is not um, putting in place stable contracts that are predictable, and it, it causes a lot of chaos. So um, on the one hand, you know, it's great that we have a 10-year contract mm -hmm. um, because we have that fundamental need for certain services and capabilities over a long period of time. On the other hand, you don't want to be locked in for, for so long and miss out on opportunities that may arise uh, very quickly out of bursts of creation. Mm -hmm. um, so I think the, the, the way the government is working in acquisition now for commercial and geospatial capabilities is to look at uh, a combination of predictability and stability, but also the ability to onboard new entrants uh, as rapidly as the innovations are coming from the commercial market. And so that's the, that's the you know, yin and yang of what we're trying to accomplish. And it's, it's, it's not simple, but it's what we have to do. Yeah. yeah, and I think that's what um, Chris Calise talks about, you know, uh, build what we must to buy what we can. Um, and I think, you know, that, that's kind of the issue here. Frank, I mean, do you see the intelligence community really doing that? Are they actually investing in commercial or there's still too much bias in favor of national technical means? So, I mean, in, in the past, of course, there, there was clashing of heads where you know, a lot of the folks in the NTM world didn't necessarily want the burgeoning commercial market. Um, I, I do want to shout out two of the past NGA directors who are here today. Thanks so much for, for being here. But through that time, but folks recognized that this was a really important thing for the government to invest in. And what was done, I think, well during Enhanced View, Next View, you know, also kind of 10-year contracts was that uh, there was some stability. Um, the Hill has messaged very strongly to the administration that our members, uh, you know, as, as taxpayers uh, and as representatives, think that this is just really vital for us to continue to invest in. But yet, when the budgets come in, we still see some level of underinvestment, which is kind of disappointing, and I, I can't go into details. But, Absolutely, the intelligence community is on board. One of the things we need to look at in the future is like, is are the military, the combatant commanders getting what everything they need? And um, you know, those of you that may read the, uh, the bill when it passes, you'll go, probably not. And so, so we need to be able to, one, advertise what the needs are of the government in a long-term fashion both in terms of volume, resolution, spectrum, you know, at, at a minimum. That, that has to be done, and we're not doing that well. Um, you know, the, the, the second thing is the predictability and the dollars. If you look at an acquisition program, you can see how much it's kind of what's going to cost. You know, I, as, a, as an oversight, part of an oversight body, I can tell you how much it's going to cost every year. But when I look at the commercial uh, line, 
still really hard to know. So we're trying to do some things to encourage the administration to, to lay that out, because that'll help give some predictability, and when you go for VC rounds, you can start to say, Here's, you know, here's total addressable market, and within the total addressable market, we think you know, we can access, access this much of it. And so that's really powerful um, on the commercial side, and, and I think it's absolutely necessary on the government side. And, and one, just snippet back to Dave, um, he, he made the, the comment about direct procurement, which I think is awesome, and I think that that's really good in terms of services. My biggest concern, and this kind of lines up uh, with what Tony was saying, is like, where does all the data, where does all the analysis come together? It has to come together at the decision level. And so if we buy, um, if we buy a direct procurement product, we, we can't expect combatant commanders or the person on the ship or the foxhole to be bringing everything together there. There has to be some forethought as to how we do that, both commercially and with the uh, national technical means systems. And I'm not seeing that happening yet. So thank you. Yeah, that's a complex uh, topic. Um, I, I'm getting a few questions from the audience about the resilience and the security issue related to commercial satellites. Um, I wonder maybe, John, if you can highlight what are the primary threats to satellites, and that includes military and commercial satellites, and since commercial is now part of the architecture, uh, maybe Dave, um, you know, as a, as a chair of the IC uh, uh, Council, um, Space Council, what, what discussions are taking place about the security protecting commercial satellites? any talks about indemnification or any uh, agreements um, that, that maybe need to be worked out in the future. Um, so anyway, John, go ahead. Sure, so let me start by summarizing the threats. I could talk on that for an hour or more, but I won't. So uh, <laughs> let, let, let me make four big points. Uh, first of all, Russia and China have currently and have a growing variety of counter space capabilities. That includes reversible capabilities like electronic warfare, uh, it includes uh, anti-satellite weapons, kinetic anti-satellite weapons that we've seen Russia test recently. China already has an operational ASAT. Uh, we see lasers, uh, the Parasvet that uh, Russia has uh, to blind uh, our capabilities on orbit, and uh, that's a growing uh, part of the counter space industry as well. Uh, the second point is the overt and covert acquisition of space technology, uh, including by cyber means, by open source, uh, by the Chinese exploiting their academic uh, con connections. And uh, this all goes to protecting our intellectual property, protecting corporate intellectual property, which is also the U.S. industrial base and which gives us our leadership. So we need to really keep that in mind. The third point is China does have, China does have a rapid and growing uh, imaging capability on orbit uh, that they will sell commercially. Notice I said sell commercially. I didn't call them commercial. That might have a different mean, uh, meaning for China than it does for us. Uh, but this year uh, alone, we expect 50 launches, and by 2025, them having about 300 satellites on orbit. And then the last point I'll make is on space debris. Uh, we launch a lot of things. Uh, I think uh, we're fairly good with best practices. Those are things we want to keep in mind. But uh, another thing to keep in mind is that Three events, three single events account for about half the trackable space debris on orbit. Two of those events were deliberate. Uh, the first one of these and most proximal was uh, Russia's ASAT test last year in 2021, and then China's ASAT test in 20 or 2007, of which 90% of that debris is still on orbit. So between those and one accidental um, encounter, if you will, a lot of debris. So. Um, with that, I guess the last thing I'll say is we did publish this back in April. It's more comprehensive. It's online. It's available to anyone. It's an unclassified report. Uh, so if you want more uh, information or deeper on the uh, space threats, uh, I would point you in that direction. That's a, that's a good overview. Thank you very much. Um, so what do we do, Dave, about uh, working with commercial on resilience uh, issues? Great question. And we believe 
that working with commercial capabilities increases our resiliency in many ways. So uh, we talk often about a hybrid space architecture. And to me, that means we make government and private space capabilities interoperable for operations. And if we're, if we're interoperable and we're, we're working in that regime and we're expecting resiliency from our commercial providers, uh, then we have some obligation to think about commercial protection. And so the IC Commercial Space Council is discussing commercial protection right now. Uh, we had a meeting on Tuesday, it, it came up. Uh, we're engaging with our industry partners to uh, have that discussion more fully. And uh, I'd say right now, everything is still on the table. And I was pleased to hear the DepSecDef earlier today say, you know, we're even considering indemnification. So that uh, all considerations are on the table and we'll work with industry and the government to figure out what the best mix is to solve that problem. Uh, Frank, um, do you think that uh, there needs to be more coordination between DOD and IC here? Uh, I mean, uh, what, what are, how do you view this problem? Between DOD and the IC? Y yes, a a absolutely. So, and it's really interesting, I see this on the Hill. Um, we have committees of jurisdiction. You know, the Armed Services Committee um, takes kind of all the Title X programs and ultimately as the warfighters, they're responsible for defend, right? For protect and defend. The intelligence community, you know, we have a mission of collecting intelligence. And um, as a national security enterprise, those two have to come together. Um, but, you know, some of the problem is on the Hill with oversight, and some of the problem is in the administration who plays the Hill committee uh, structure off of each other. But we're bringing that to an end. Um, I'm really encouraged by what I'm seeing from leadership, from our members on both the Intelligence Committee and Armed Services, um, increasingly calling for kind of shared hearings, um, shared insight, and that will allow those of us at the staff level to start asking questions about, so we have this huge commercial constellation, where do they fall out? Or do they fall out? Or do we just plan on them being lost? We can start asking those kind of questions. And I think those are, those are really important questions to have answers to, um, because it has, it has ramifications on the commercial investment side. Um, you know, if you read a prospectus, you're going to see, you know, risks in national security, and that's going to be one of the things that's going to be in there. And, and so um, I, I am very optimistic with the direction it's heading, um, I think, on the executive branch. Um, things are working much, much better. And I think uh, Chris Galise, I think, um, you know, the Space Force are working very well together to kind of come up with a comprehensive approach. Uh, the details of which we could never go into here, but um, but certainly our industry partners at some point should know this is kind of how we're thinking about it. So great area. So, so Tony and James, um, how are your companies preparing for this environment where it's a contested battlefield and you're in it? Um, I mean, I, I, are you doing any anything in, 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 in beyond the, your normal? cybersecurity protections and things like that? Are you doing anything um, differently? Uh, we're definitely, uh, a couple of comments. We're encouraged by the, the dialogue. I think, you know, the, it's the true public-private partnership, you know, to address, uh, you know, what is a uh, increasingly contested and congested environment. And, and, and as we're more essential to uh, sensitive missions, you know, there's increased threat. I don't think I think that's pretty clear. So um, one of the things that we're doing is, uh, you know, as, as, we, as you mentioned earlier, you know, we play in multiple markets. Um, so you know, so with Maxar, you know, the U.S. government is a key mission partner. We also work with many international governments, you know, around the world, uh, and we have an enterprise, you know, business, you know, as well. And uh, Frank made the comment earlier about you know we as industry, you know, we we need to be able to you know help our share owners understand the total addressable market. Uh, that we can support, uh, I, you know, as I've kind of worked in the public sector now uh, for uh, over 10 years, 
you know, understanding the total addressable mission is important as well. Uh, and, and that's how we can deepen, you know, the partnership. And so, you know, specific to this issue, you know, we've been having conversations with different mission partners about, you know, what we do today, what we could do in the future. Uh, and, you know, as you look at some of the, the big trends, uh, you know, so uh, John talked about uh, space domain awareness, you know, there's capability, you know, that we have in non-Earth imaging, you know, where we think we can contribute, you know, to that mission. Uh, and, you know, really excited about the potential of that because it's a, it's a big problem, you know, that, that we see as enduring, that can, you know, leverage our constellation. There's other areas, uh, you know, another modernization effort at DIA is the Mars, you know, program. And, and so as we can uh, provide that characterization, you know, into foundational intelligence, you know, that's playing a critical role. As we take on more of those missions, you know, then we know there's more of a threat. Uh, and so I think, you know, we're, we're that, but as the market's bigger, it allows us to make more investment, you know, to mitigate those threats. Thank you. James? Yeah, I'll add, um, well, I'll start with my uh, CEO. Uh, I'll crib a line from him. He likes to say you can't minor in national security sales, and that's true. You are kind of, we're either in or we're out, right? Um, where I'm encouraged to see the conversation go over the last five years or so is, Dave already mentioned, uh, the hybrid space architecture as a concept. And I think one of the key things that that concept and the, the folks up here on the, the government side have advanced is it doesn't have to be binary. You're in or out from an engagement standpoint. You know, we are able to have very frank, honest conversations with um, not just the user community, but the mission assurance community within the government. Um, most of which we can't relay here, and that's good. If we were being totally shut out of those conversations, then we're not able to be a responsible partner. Part of that hybrid space architecture concept is differing levels of trust, and so even between different commercial providers, there may be different levels of trust in terms of the data that is brought in, in terms of our data security, um, but without having those, uh, those earnest and honest conversations with the government side of the house, um, we're not able together as a community to work towards how that looks. So I would say, yes, we're absolutely doing things uh, differently now in light of kind of world events than we have in the past, and I'm really encouraged to see that. Uh, just really quickly, um, a, a, an audience question that asks to clarify, Frank, did you uh, say, can you clarify that you're going to declassify parts of the NRO and NGA budget? Is that, is that what you said? Please <laughs> no, but it, it's a it, you know it's not an unreasonable question, right? It it really isn't. I think um, it, anybody that's in the acquisition procurement world does have a an opportunity to see kind of what we call the program documents, and so I would expect that um, that at the level of classification, and most of those would be secret or TSTK. Um, that those would be shared, um, uh, you know, I, I believe those would be shared with industry. Um, we don't want it to be a surprise. We want to be able to telegraph what the investment profile looks like, but like a, uh, like a prospectus, you know, yesterday's performance is no guarantee of the future's uh, outlays, right? And so because these funds are you know, currently in RDT and E, which is two-year money. Um, you know, it, it doesn't give you a whole a long look, but you can still build a profile so the industry can know what, you know, kind of how it looks. But no, we we wouldn't be uh, anytime soon uh, declassifying the um, the investment there. But but we would be, I think, showing um, doing a better job of showing the the next at least the fit up the future year defense plan. Thank Th you. Thank you for clarifying that. Um, a, a couple questions for, for, for the government uh, officials as far as opportunities. Um, you know, small businesses, as you know, there's a lot of small businesses that are doing innovative things. You know, they may not have the mature technologies like, you know, these guys, but um, how does NGA engage or how do these companies engage with NGA? What, what would be your advice to them? Great, thank you. I, I love small business innovation. So this is a, a place where we worked really hard in my organization to set up a defined path for a new, uh, a company that's new to the government to come in the front door, uh, meet with us, 
showcase their capabilities, uh, get a sense of what the government needs might be, and, um, and engage in a, a partnership so that we can work towards mutual benefit. So we've, we've established a few different operating paradigms uh, that have been working. One is uh, the, I the idea of um, a no-cost contract, um, or even better, we've started using something called a bailment agreement, which is a, a way for the government to legally take possession of a company's goods and services, test them, evaluate them, and then give them back. Um, so I like to say sometimes I operate the Intel community's largest pawn shop because <laughs> we're running um, these capabilities through their paces and then giving them back to the companies uh, in a way that is um, very quick to put in place and, and legally acceptable. So uh, several of companies that have done that with bailment agreements have gone on to then competitively win future contracts. And so we're proud to that we have that established pathway um, to bring companies on for that. And uh, because Frank did it earlier, I'd be remiss if I didn't also give a shout out to the former NGA director sitting in the audience. So thank you. <laughs> so if I could just add one or two things real quick. So yeah. uh, I'll, I'll pile on what Dave said. You know, we like small companies, right? That's where you get a lot of the innovation. Uh, that's where a lot of these guys started. Uh, We've worked with things like the InQtel folks uh, to do uh, work programs. Uh, we also have what I'll call a front door. We call it Needopedia. It's on our website. That's how small businesses or big businesses can float white papers to us. And depending on the topic, it will get to the right folks. And we'll take a look at those. And uh, then we'll do a follow-up if uh, we want to do a follow-up. Oh, Dave, I mean, the, the vice president, um, you know, she had the, the, the council, the, the National Space Council meeting, and she said, uh, we're going to be talking about regulations for the industry for the millennium, for the new millennium. Um, what, what does that mean? What, what, is, what is the government going to do to maybe bring more players and, and more innovation into the community? Okay, that, that's a, um, a big topic. Uh, we have heard uh, a good amount of feedback from industry that our, our regulations, especially with commercial remote sensing, uh, in previous decades, you know, put us on a path to be um, behind, in some cases, in, in foreign technology available in the market. Um, so we work very hard with the regulatory authorities to put out a new rule in 2020 for commercial remote sensing regulation, which has advanced us quite, quite a way forward. Um, but when it comes to looking at new novel space activities from commercial vendors, things like in-space servicing, assembly, manufacturing, tourism, uh, those, those activities uh, today don't have a regulatory framework. And so the concept here is, again, predictability and stability. You know, without, a, without government rules, it's hard for companies to, to see, successfully get investment to enter into these new types of businesses, but we desperately need them to. So the idea is to create the regulatory framework, make it one that's more about um, mission authorizations and uh, supervision and less about limiting technology or applying conditions on these companies. And so I think that's a, a new paradigm for the new millennium. The IC Commercial Space Council is working on a proposal in that regard um, because you know we all heard on Friday at the National Space Council meeting that we're being um, directed to, to work in that regard. So we're, we're looking forward to it. Thank you very much, Dave. Um, and just a quick uh, PSA um, before we close the panel. Um, please join us in the exhibit hall outside the Potomac Ballroom after the session for networking and exhibits break. And I would like to thank our distinguished panel for all their insights. Thank you very much. And uh, please join me in a round of applause.